I traveled to the end of the world. Part two, on board the MV Ocean Victory. In part one of this video series, I described how me and one of my closest friends booked a trip to Antarctica with Rose Scholar and flew from Miami, Florida to Ushuaia, Argentina. The first three days of our 14 day trip was spent in transit and on land in Ushuaia, Argentina, the most Southern city in Argentina. On day four, we finally embarked on a ship where we were to live for the next 10 days, the Albatross Expedition's MV Ocean Victory. Now, let me immediately say that I was really impressed and very satisfied by the service given by the MV Ocean Victory crew, but I'll get into the specifics a bit later. If I had to sail with another service crew in the future, this is the crew I would choose. Let's start with check-in. Check-in and amenities. As far as leaving our hotel in Ushuaia and embarking on the ship, Rose Scholar, my tour group, made the process seamless, just like they did for the past three days. I talked more about Rose Scholar in video one of this three-part video series, so be sure to check that video out if you haven't already done so. Our luggage was loaded on our charter bus outside the hotel, and after a 10-minute ride to port and a short wait on the bus, our luggage was immediately taken by ship's crew and placed outside of our compartment doors. As we boarded the ship, we were immediately welcomed with first-class service. Unfortunately for my friend, the luxury of the ship was quite the opposite of what he had expected. I wanted to tell me, tell me what you feel about this. I wanted to rough it, man. I thought we were gonna kind of like have um, something a little bit more uncomfortable. Okay, okay. And this is like 10 star. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. He wanted the experience to simulate the rugged transit of early Antarctica expeditioners. Instead, we were greeted with smiles and welcome drinks. We then had to get our room key as part of the check-in process. And that's when I saw the diversity of passengers. I had no idea that different tour groups and individuals besides Rose Scholar will be on the ship. It was a nice surprise learning that we had the ability to engage with others our age in addition to the other Rose Scholar. There were people of all ages, races, sexes, and nationalities on the cruise ship. Our stateroom. We were also surprised by the luxury of our room. We had a deck balcony with a beautiful view of the ocean and our bathroom actually had a heated floor tile. The television entertainment included a selection of movies, documentaries, and the live streamed lectures on board the ship. Open the door to the bathroom real quick. Sure. Oh, this is not a porthole. Oh um, man, we gonna die, dog. Um, there yeah. we gonna die, dog. So, so we bought, we bought I, I upgraded this to the free room package. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Open it up so Open I can get the video. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's pretty decent. You yeah. hate it. Why do you hate it, dog? Talk to me. Because, man, I want this to be a British expedition okay. into, into, into the cold, and we're braving it, and it's gritty, and it's dangerous. Instead, I got like Trump Tower on floor number six with a balcony view. Now, if the roadway hits me, I, I won't complain. At least <laughs> there was some danger involved. Internet service. The ship also provided internet for a fee. If I remember correctly, the price of the internet was $125 for a 24-hour internet pass or $700 for unlimited internet. And when I say 24 hours of internet, I mean you could log in and log out whenever you wanted. And if you're frugal enough with your minutes, you could have technically got away with a 24-hour pass for the entire voyage. As long as you log out of your account, when you finish with your internet task, your time usage would have stopped. My friend and I shared two 24-hour passes over the course of the voyage. We would have used less, but we would sometimes forget to log off and he had work to be back home, which made him use the internet more than he would like to. And, and of course, we needed to share pictures on Instagram. I'd estimate that the satellite internet speeds were about 3 megs for download and 1.5 megs for upload. Um, I thought the internet would be spotty once we got closer to mainland Antarctica, but the internet service functioned pretty consistently throughout our voyage. The lounges and bars. The MV Ocean Victory has a few lounges and connecting bars, a fitness center, and yes, even a heated hot tub. The price of alcohol wasn't included in the Rose Scholar all-inclusive plan, but the ship didn't mind if you brought your own alcohol on board. Plenty of my fellow scholars brought wine that they had purchased in Ushuaia to the dinner table. And if I remember correctly, no one was charging an uncorking fee. 
But even if you didn't bring your own alcohol on board and still wanted to drink a cocktail or two or three, the drink prices were very reasonable at less than $10 on average per cocktail. The ship also sold a relatively large selection of alcohols and wines. If you just wanted to take a bottle to your room, that was your choice as well. So there were huge opportunities to self-medicate or rather relax on the cheap if that's something that you would like to do. The ship's library. During the voyage, I usually spent the first half of my day doing work in the ship's library, which was always quiet for the most part. Right after breakfast, I sat on the couch, drank black coffee, and enjoyed the views of random penguins, whales, and birds. In the evenings, we drank, conversed, and made friends with other shipboard patrons, including the bartender in the Albatross Observations Lounge. You could take great pictures and take in marvelous views from the Observation Lounge, which meant I didn't have to go outside in the cold to enjoy the surrounding views. The Shackleton Lounge. Most lectures were given in the Shackleton Lecture Room or the Lounge, the same place we had to gather for our pre-departure safety brief. This is also where the crew laid out daily complimentary coffee, tea, and water in various cookie flavors for most mornings until the evening cleanup. If the lounge wasn't in use by the ship, patrons could use it at any time to work, play games, drink, or converse with each other. If we didn't want to attend the lectures, we had access to live lectures recordings on our stateroom televisions. The Fitness Center. The Fitness Center was very modern and clean. I went once, but only to get some great video footage. If I had wanted to use a fitness center, I'm glad they had one. There was a choice of four different cardio machines. You can choose from a water roar, a arc trainer, elliptical, or a recumbent bike. There was a weightlifting station and a small area for stretching and aerobics. Heated hot tubs. The ship had two heated hot tubs. I didn't get into them, but several people did on several different days. You'd think that it'd be too cold to enter a deck top pool, but you'll be wrong. The strong rays from the sun beaming through clear skies from above put the area temperature around 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Yet, it felt much warmer when you received the sun's direct hits and its reflections off the clear waters and the white snow. So, when the ship docked during Zodiac cruises, as long as the waters were calm and there was no threat of bad weather, the bridge watch will get permission from the captain to fill the hot tub. And when the hot tubs were open, a good majority of folks donned their swimsuits, grabbed a few drinks and portable stereo, and crowded into one of the two heated hot tubs to enjoy their time on the deck. Dining. Now, the taste of food served on cruises and at hotels is always hard to objectively review. Um, each person has their own taste preference, and everyone always has an opinion on which food should be served. I believe it becomes even more difficult for business when they have to serve an international crowd. But what the MV Ocean Victory did really well was offer variety. Breakfast, from an American diet perspective, was standard, but choice was plentiful. Breakfast was buffet style and was typically served with a two hour window. Drinks were the typical juice drinks like orange or cranberry, but you could also order milk, water, and coffee. Surprisingly, you could even order your coffee with oat or almond milk. Um, there was dry cereal, fruits, a daily omelet chef who made personalized omelets with your choice of vegetables, meats, and cheeses. And other choices varied from scrambled eggs, bacon, potatoes, pancakes, french toast, and other bread, and plenty of pastries. I usually ended up with an egg white breakfast omelet, a few slices of bacon, and black coffee. Lunch. Lunch doesn't really stand out in my memory. I'm guessing it's because it was more or less the same as the buffet style, like breakfast, with the only difference being the food served. It's probably because I didn't eat many lunches. I do remember a variety of meats, rice, pastas, and vegetables though. And of course, a variety of different breads and lunch desserts. Dinner. Now, dinner is where the MV Ocean Victory wowed its guests as best they could. The dinner was served in the Beagle restaurant where we ate breakfast and lunch, and on a higher deck in the Panorama Specialty Restaurant. In the Beagle Restaurant, we could either order from the chef's nightly menu or from a specialty menu, which had a selection of chicken breasts, steaks, and fish that you could pair with a couple of rices or potatoes. I ended up with either a grilled chicken breast or steak and rice most nights. 
because I was trying to eat lower calorie meals to compensate for the high calorie drinks that I knew I would consume at night. Hot plates were served in a specialty restaurant most nights, meaning that you can give the waitress your choice of meat and they brought it raw on a hot bed of coal where you had to cook it yourself. It was often served with potatoes, rice, vegetables, and a variety of spices and oils as seasoning. I thought it was pretty daring of the crew. It, it definitely was a memorable experience, which could have easily turned tragic had the hot plate fallen onto someone's lap, but none of that happened. We cooked our steaks, had plenty of wine, and talked and coughed through the lightly ventilated, smoke-filled room while overlooking the Antarctica borders. We had to open the rear doors to let the smoke out the room faster, but enduring the smoke was worth the wonderful view. A barbecue deck. On the fifth night, dinner was served outside on the barbecue deck. It was an amazing experience, but not very practical if you don't enjoy eating your food in cold air. The sun warmed the area around the ship during the day, but it became much cooler and windier as the sun partially faded during the evening. The climate was great as long as the sun was shining on the deck, but as soon as the ship drifted in a cloudy region, it immediately became chilly. Still, lots of people, including my friend and I, walked through the cold air and enjoyed our meal in one of the most visually appealing settings I've ever been in. And when it did get too cold for me, I escaped into the specialty lounge to eat my dinner while still enjoying the ocean view. Yes, yeah, so I just wanted to take this quick video. Um, I'm on the deck, and as you can see, I'm in a t-shirt, but I'm in Antarctica. <laughs> um, so, what I find interesting is that the sun is so hot. First of all, I have uh, sunscreen lotion on, but the sun is beaming so hot that I actually feel pretty warm right in this location. But as soon as I go somewhere on a ship where the sun um, is not exposed and I'm in shade, it gets really cold really quickly but anyway tonight we're gonna have a uh, a burger fest on the deck and we actually have the hot tub there's one here and there's a hot tub on the other side so we're going to enjoy this evening in the sun eating some burgers and I can't wait excursions and activities Luckily, we didn't just cruise from Argentina to Antarctica with little to do. I already talked about the entertainment suite and the bars, but there were also activities and excursions. The included free activities were all the educational lectures, a tour of the ship's bridge, the Zodiac boat cruises and landings, the polar plunge, and the customary cocktail with the captain. Different lectures occurred at various times on different days and included lectures about the region and its animals. The Zodiac boat cruises and landings happen twice per day on average once we made it to the Antarctica region. I'll talk more about these in my next video when I talk through the day-to-day -day of the trip. Paid excursions. The extra excursions were an extra expense but the prices weren't too bad from what I heard. The extra excursions included kayaking, snowshoeing in different areas of the region, and an overnight camp stay. People really enjoy these extra experiences and are now among the elite few in the world to say that they either kayak, snowshoe, or slept on the Antarctica continent. Service. Now, the crew of the MV Ocean Victory provided exceptional service and took care to keep us informed throughout the day. When we asked for a meal, even after breakfast hours were technically over, we were cooked a plate of food. According to the staff, it was no bother because it was not like they all had some other place to go. <laughs> My friend was provided oat milk instead of almond milk for his morning coffee when he just happened to ask for it on the first day and the staff remembered his personal preference for the duration of the voyage. By day two, the omelet chef remembered both of our personal preferences for omelets. All spaces of the ship was, were promptly cleaned and always maintained. And when we had questions, they were promptly answered. And if we wanted something, the staff went out of their way to provide it. So if you watch the movie Triangle of Sadness on Netflix, you'll get a sense of how we were treated. So in Triangle of Sadness, the cruise ship's staff met every guest's demand because they were trained never to say no. 
even when one of the guests demanded that all of the staff take a swim in the shipboard pool, including the chef who was busy preparing the evening meal. I'm confident we would have gotten the same outcome had we asked the elephant in the room, COVID-19. The last thing I'll mention about being on board is, despite making vaccinations mandatory and verifying all guests, we still had a few confirmed cases of COVID-19. But the ship did keep everyone informed. The first case was announced on the second day, and the second confirmed case was announced a few days later. During our pre-departure brief, the ship highly suggested that we wore masks and that we constantly take precautions like using hand sanitizer before meals, but masks were never mandated. They even informed us that they had a few confirmed cases on their last two previous voyages as well. Some people wore masks while others did not, though everyone who chose to eat in the public dining areas sat among everyone else who, of course, wasn't wearing masks. That said, I think the majority of the ship caught COVID-19, but only the two people who became physically ill, as in they got headaches and were throwing up, actually went to the ship for a doctor. I, I definitely caught a runny nose and had an incessant cough for a few days. And I noticed the same cough in a lot of the crew and guests as well. I took the best personal precautions I could by keeping my distance and wearing a mask in small spaces, but I didn't go to the doctor for a confirmed diagnosis. Uh, the two people who did, I believe, was voluntarily confined to their rooms. In fact, one of the people who caught a confirmed case was part of my Rose Scholar group, and I know that he definitely stayed in his room for the first few days. My point is, if you think you're gonna catch COVID-19, you're, you're probably right. Chances are high that you'll catch it after traveling thousands of miles on an enclosed airspace like an airplane with hundreds of other people who are all breathing the same air and then living on board a cruise ship with another hundred people for 10 days all while breathing the same air in confined spaces. So you're definitely taking a risk. But I loved how the ship allowed us to manage our risk taking decisions on our own after they informed us of the shipboard health concerns. The truth of the matter is, no one wanted to spend $15,000 to sit in their rooms. In this case, the risk of catching COVID-19 had a cost, and we all paid the price to potentially catch it. Underway. And now that I got all of that out of the way, it's time to dig a little deeper into the daily routines and excursions throughout the duration of our voyage. In the next video, I'll be discussing a bit about what we did, where we went, and what we saw. It'll be so exciting now that we're going underway. If you found this video helpful and you want to learn what the day to day was like on our Antarctica excursion, be sure to subscribe to my channel so you'll be notified when I release video three. And if you haven't watched the first video in the series, you can easily watch it now by following the link in this video's description. Last, if you have any questions, be sure to leave it in the comment section and I'll try to answer it as soon as I can. In the meantime, be safe and go travel. You have everywhere to go see.